Good evening and welcome to Artist Talk on Art on Monday, January 15th, 2024. Thank you everyone for joining us. I'm Miriam Deutsch, uh, ATOA Programming Director. Uh, founded in 1974, ATOA is the wor art world's longest running and preeminent forum. We are now in our 50th year and we're looking uh, look for more information soon about our gala and auction in May. Our archive resides at Archives of American Art of the Smithsonian, where it has surpassed 8,500 artists and 1,000 panels and dialogues. See uh, Artist Talk on Art YouTube channel to view our 100 recent Zoom recordings. Uh, I also want to remind people that comments made by our presenters do not necessarily reflect those of ATOA. And next week, Monday, January 22nd at 7 p.m., uh, the panel will be consist of ATOA's president's panel. Uh, our past presidents will be here. You'll hear about ATOA's remarkable history and so much more. Tonight, we are so proud to present a legacy recording from 2005 featuring groundbreaking artist Faith Ringgold and dialogue with Nancy Azara, sculptor and feminist. It's an amazing, stimulating conversation and presentation that elicited very interesting comments and questions from the audience. So um, I hope you enjoy this uh, historical recording. And I'll, I'll just a comment that, um, if you hear a little buzzing in the recording, just turn down your volume a bit and the buzzing will uh, disappear. So with that, uh, Maruna, please start the recording. Good evening, I'm Doug Shear, Chairman of Artist Talk on Art. I'd like to welcome you all. I want to mention a few things about upcoming events before we start tonight's panel. Uh, also, if you have any cell phones or beepers or whatever, please remember to turn those off. Next week here, we're having uh, an event that um, is called Analog Dreams Digital World. And that features two professors from SVA, Trilby Schreiber, uh, who is an analog and digital media designer, uh, illustrator and producer, is the moderator. Uh, and joining her are Sean Adair, filmmaker and photographer, cameraman and editor for documentaries. Um, John Fisher, Fisher, who has done many, many events with Artist Talk on Art is an artist, composer, and pianist. And Matt St. Leger, an SVA Film School Honors graduate. Um, and that's here next week. Two weeks from now, there is a PBS connected event. The uh, independent documentary group called Art 21, which produces um, a really um, impeccably produced magazine format show, uh, the most recent of which was on air uh, in September, uh, is bringing artist Fred Wilson here to the amphitheater. Uh, for those of you that may not know a lot about Fred Wilson, although probably you do know who he is, uh, he is a recipient of a John and Catherine MacArthur Foundation Achievement Award and a Larry Aldrich Foundation Award and is a distinguished visiting fellow in object exhibition and knowledge at Skidmore College uh, and represented the United States at the Biennale uh, in Cairo in 1992 and the Venice Biennale in 2003. So we're very excited to have Fred Wilson here two weeks from now. Um, moderating that panel will be, uh, gotta get myself some changes in that week um, is Wesley Miller, uh, who is an assistant curator of Art 21. Anyway, that's two weeks from now. To introduce tonight's guests, I'd like to bring Donna Marxer, who's right behind me, up here and let her do that. Thanks, Donna. 
Hi, everybody. I'm just absolutely delighted to have these two remarkable women here tonight. Um, they were very, very important to me, to all of us women artists back in the 70s. They're pioneers in the feminist art movement, and uh, they were in large part responsible for making changes that, had, that changed the whole art world, not just women in the art world. Uh, in alphabetical order is Nancy Az Azara. Uh, Nancy is a sculptor who has been teaching for 35 years. Her sculpture has been widely reviewed in such publications as the New York Times, Art in America, Art Forum, Sculpture Magazine, and has been exhibited widely in the United States and Europe uh, she's had solo exhibitions at the Donahue Sosinski Art and AIR in New York, among many others. Um, she's traveled extensively and was an artisan resident in Kursala, India in 2002. She is a recipient of the Adolf and Esther Gottlieb Foundation Grant, the Susan B. Anthony Award. There's a feminist for you. And most recently, a, a Bo Bogliasco? Bogliasco? Did I get it? Foundation Fellowship. Nancy came of age during the feminist movement of the 60s. She was founder of the New York Feminist Art Institute in 1979, where she was on the board and taught a workshop called Consciousness Raising, Visual Diaries, Art Making, for, some, for many years. Uh, she's completed many large sculpture commissions, and I'm sure you will be treated to seeing some of those images tonight. And then we have faith. Faith, I haven't seen Faith, I think, in 25 years, except once on the Phil Donahue show, <laughs> which really impressed me. Faith Ringo began her artistic career more than 35 years ago as a painter. Today, she is best known for her painted story quilts, art that combines painting, quilted fabric, and storytelling. She's exhibited in major museums in the USA, Europe, South America, Asia, Africa, and the Middle East. She's in the permanent collection of many museums, including the Studio Museum in Harlem, the Solomon R. Guggenheim Museum, the Metropolitan, and the Museum of Modern Art. Her first book, Tar Beach, was a Caldecott Honor Book and winner of the Coretta Scott King Award for illustration, among numerous other honors. She has written and illustrated 11 children's books. She has received more than 75 awards, fellowships, citations, and honors, including the Solomon R. Guggenheim Foundation Fellowship for Painting, two National Endowment for the Art Awards, and 17 honorary doctorates, one of which is from her alma mater, the City College of New York. Uh, both of, both of um, our uh, Wonder Women have some of their books for sale uh, tonight, so I hope you'll avail yourselves of those at the end of the evening. And I give you Wonder Women. <laughs> I think I'm going to go first. Well, I would like to thank all of you for inviting me here today, this evening. Even though I did come late, I'm so sorry about that. But better late than never. I'm going to begin by reading a story to you, Why the Women Could Fly. And then I'm going to go through my slides very quickly. So the whole thing shouldn't be more than 15 minutes, as we agreed. And if it is, just stop me. I can stop anywhere. Why the Women Could Fly. It all began when the men and women gathered around the great lady to get all the things they needed to live on the earth. When she took out the wings, the men asked, what are wings for? And the women grinned and giggled because they knew wings were for them. The great lady answered, wings are so the people can fly. But all the men heard was the word fly. And they gasped and looked down to see if she was talking about their fly. And in that second, the women tucked 
the wings to their sides having already grinned and giggled, they shed a tear, threw a kiss, flapped their wings and took off with a swoosh, quickly darting from cloud to cloud and were gone. And that is the first we knew that the women could fly. But we always heard that women had magical ways and that they could make do with just a little and pretend it was a lot and cause, and cause things to look good when they weren't at all and have everybody feeling fine when they really felt bad. And so we call them women instead of men and female instead of male because no one knew what else to call them. And that was okay because we didn't know what to make of them anyway, considering the fact that they could make babies and could fly. Folks say back in slavery days, the women would forget and fly off to freedom and have to come back and get the men. And back in Africa, the women would slip off into the bush with their wings tucked under their arms, and then they'd grin, giggle, shed a tear, blow a kiss, flap their wings, and go swoosh, and they'd take off into the sky, quickly darting from cloud to cloud and be gone. The next day, they'd pretend they had been home all the time. But everyone knew better because the rains came and the crops grew and a child was born and the people rejoiced and everything that was wrong was now right in the village. And the women would just grin and giggle and say they didn't know anything about it. But one day the men followed them and when the women got to the clearing in the bush and spread their wings to take off into the sky, the men called out, stop, come back. And the women stopped and came back and the men said, this is men's work. We will take care of whatever business you have in the sky. Give us your wings so we can fly. And so the women thought about it long and hard, and the men got impatient with waiting and demanded that the women give them their wings. And so the women, although fearing there would be trouble, gave the men their wings. But every time the men went to fly, there would be a woman or two who would go along to grin, giggle, shed a tear, blow a kiss, and flap her wings. And then we'd feel a cool breeze and hear a swoosh, and the men would take off into the sky, quickly darting from cloud to cloud and be gone. And the next day, the rains came and the crops grew and, the ch and a child was born. We'd rejoice and everything that was wrong was now right in the village. And the men would just smile and the women would too. But before long, the men got the idea to attack neighboring villages if they did not surrender their land. And so the men's village grew and grew and they became rich and powerful and we call that progress because no one knew what else to call it. Then other villages thought of doing the same thing. So now there were villages everywhere fighting over land and resources and we call that war. And the men were called warriors because we didn't know what else to call them. And that was okay because no one knew what to make of it anyway, except that the men always found something to war about. It was either land, rights, causes, beliefs, something. But the women rarely went to war, what with having children, teaching, and taking care of everything at home. Women simply didn't have time to go to war. And furthermore, the women hated war because their men had to go and often did not come back. But still the men went to war over one thing and another and the women had babies and took care of everything at home. And we call them housewives and mothers because we didn't know what else to call them. And the men were called husbands and fathers. Though they were rarely home, what with their love of wars, mergers, sports, games, and other things. But it was okay because no one really knew what to make of all this anyway. And so the men took what they wanted because they needed it and that was okay because no one knew what else to do. And then when they wanted more things, they looked around to see who had the things they wanted and they found that some things could be people. 
And so they took the people and called them slaves. And the people who were called slaves worked free, and we call that slavery. And that made the men even more rich and powerful. And that was not okay, but no one knew how to stop it. One day the women decided to no longer grin, giggle, shed a tear, throw a kiss, and flap their wings to set the men off to fly. And without that, the men's wings would not work because it was really only the women who could fly, and everybody knew that, and now the men knew too. So the men lost their fascination with wings that could fly. They now had airplanes they could fly in and make war at the same time, and that was called air warfare because no one knew what else to call it or what to make of it anyway, except for the women who were really deeply concerned with war, slavery, poverty, oppression, greed, and hunger in the villages. And so the women looked at the world and threw up their hands in despair, and their bodies went up too. And they went up, up, up into the sky, and they looked down on all the problems of war, and they knew they had the power to change this because they were the ones who made the babies to keep all this going. And so the women grinned, giggled, shed a tear, threw a kiss, flapped their wings, and we heard a thunderous roar and swoosh. They went up, up, up into the outer sky, and they have never been heard from again until right now. Thank you. And now I'm going to show you uh, a short survey of my work from the 1960s when I first became an artist here in New York City. I'm trying to push the first button, but nothing is happening. What's that? <laughs> that will. Can I make it go here? What's wrong with mine? Okay, very good. Thank you. Okay, I'm starting out in the 60s. The 60s was the period in which I did these uh, political paintings that indeed made me not so popular in New York or anywhere else, maybe. Uh, so the late 60s, I began, I changed my palette and did more political paintings. This one for the Women's House of Detention. Uh, in the 70s, my work became feminist in that I was trying to show a women's uh, view of art, a women's materials, or using women's materials. And I began making dolls, doing performances, and I made my first quilt. And when I did that, it really set me off. Uh, the next time I did a quilt, in 1983, I, I made a story quilt, which I found out later was a story quilt. I just thought I was telling a story on my art. And then I made many more, in which I told all kinds of stories. This one is about weight loss. Faith Ringgold's over 100 pound weight loss performance story quilt. At this same time, I had tried to write my autobiography and couldn't get it published. And so that was one of the reasons why I was absolutely writing about everything. Uh, you know, if I couldn't get it published, the thing to do would be to accelerate and write more and more and more until finally I would get something published. So I performed my autobiography and I wrote about it. I did a lot of commissions at one of Maya Angelou, <laughs> Michael Jackson. Sonny Rollins. And then I came into uh, the Women on a Bridge series and I did Tar Beach, which came to be my first published work and it was a children's book. I didn't even know I could write a children's story. Well, because I wrote so much, you know, it really opened me up for people to see what I could do. Church Picnic, another commission for the High Museum, 
um, another, um, well, not a commission, actually. I did this with Marlon Riggs, who was a very famous uh, filmmaker who died of AIDS, and I wanted to do something for him before he died. And so he came to my studio, and I did this, Marlon Riggs' Tongues Untied. Freedom of speech, um, really something that I'm very passionate about, one's ability to speak their mind and continue to do it as long as we have the freedom to do it. We're into the 90s at this point. This is in the subway at uh, 125th Street in Lenox Avenue. It's a mosaic. It, it's called Hero Echo, uh, Heroes and Heroines. Call them heroes and heroines. Um, the French collection I did in the 1990s, which I went to France and stayed for six months, and uh, you know used all of those masters of, of European art that I was taught to, to copy from to uh, create my own stories, and I mixed it with the black culture of all kinds. Uh, then I did the American collection, We Came to America, in which I, I set a slave ship of, of uh, slaves free with the torch of the um, uh, Lady um, Statue of Liberty, which originally was a black woman. Um, born in a cotton field, my first sort of fairy tale kind of story which also uh, a, a book came out of that. Um, this one here very close to me has to do with my moving to Englewood, New Jersey from Harlem. And it is called uh, Coming to Jones Road. And I've done many, many images of this. This is, this is my Under a Blood Red Sky uh, series, which um, when I moved to Jones Road, um, you know, I was found myself surrounded by hostile neighbors who didn't like the idea of a black woman living next door to them. So I decided to bring all my ancestors as well in this series called Coming to Jones Road. So this is really about the Underground Railroad. Uh, I got the feel of it for the first time in my life when I moved to Englewood. 9-11, I was uh, really propelled into doing a whole lot of uh, flag stories about 9-11 on Tuesday morning is the name of this one. Presently, I'm into making jazz pictures. And this one is about Mama Can Sing and Papa Can Blow. I am, uh, I've always loved jazz and music. Um, I never thought of it as political until just recently. I realized that without it, uh, I probably wouldn't be standing here talking to you if the slaves had not come over here with this great ability to sing and this beautiful uh, um, collection of uh, musical uh, aesthetics, uh, I think we probably would have gone the same way as the American Indian. And now I want to just show you very quickly a, um, a book that I wrote uh, in tribute to uh, Rosa Parks, who just died. And um, this is a book for children. And, and I've done 13 or so of them. And this one depicts her getting arrested and Martin Luther King's house burned down. And how that simple act on her part really ignited the whole country in different ways to stand up for equal rights on public transportation. Thank you.
Hi. I'm going to um, both read from my book called Spirit Taking Form, Making a Spiritual Practice of Making Art. How's the sound? It's good? Okay, because as you know, it can always echo. I think I'm echoing. All right. Um, there are stories in my book, and there are um, meditations, and there are comments about the process of art making. I'll read you a few stories, and then, well, we'll just start. I'll just go on, and it'll be a little bit of all of that. The fabric. The fabric has been in a cedar trunk for 35 years. I remember when I bought it. I don't exactly remember the circumstances, but I remember its elegance and its feel. I have always thought that the color, a vibrant Navajo turquoise, was the wrong color for me, for my complexion, but I wanted it anyway. Maybe just to look at it and touch it was enough then. It's thick, double-layered satin, and it is the kind of surface woven with fine silk threads that almost reflects your image when you look into it. I have saved and saved it. I have always thought I would use it with some other fabric and make a jacket for an opening of one of my shows, a special ex exhibition, a museum retrospective, say. I would wear this satin made into a jacket with black velvet sleeves and collar, but there it sits waiting in the trunk. This fabric, so sumptuous, sumptuous to touch, brings all kinds of sensory pleasure to me. It's expansive and open, and it extends itself. It was the opposite of my childhood, in which everything was also planned, plotted, and expected. Narrow like a camera's eye, more and more focused on the only way, the right way. The rules and regulations of every moment of the day. This fabric, with its fine weave and in-your-face elegance, represents everything my childhood could not be. It represents abandon, loss of control, center stage, spotlights, and accomplishment. The accomplishment of a well-behaved girl child who struggles and succeeded in becoming her own woman. So this is from 1970 or so. And I recently wrote for the Women's Caucus for Art exhibit called Revisioning at the Maitland Art Center in Maitland, Florida, where I was the juror. This is, 19, this is 2000, I always forget, we're, we moved on from the 1900s here. This is 2005. I remember when in 1970, I would rarely find women's art in a public setting. When I did find women's art in exhibits, it was a single artist's work here and there, usually tucked in among the men's work. It has been a long struggle, but a heartening one to come to in 2005. To find so many women artists working and showing, speaking in their art about their visions, their lives, translating it to color and form, their unique voices, making public their presence. We may not so easily realize it now, but considering millenniums of lack of recognition and rejection, making and showing art is a courageous act for women. I love this quote from Georgia O'Keeffe. I grew up pretty much as everyone else grows up, and one day, seven years ago, I found myself saying to myself, I can't live where I want to. I can't do what I want to. I can't even say what I want to. Things and schools and that painters have taught me even keep me from painting as I want to. I decided that I was a very stupid fool not to at least paint as I wanted to and say what I wanted to when I painted as that seemed to be the only thing I could do that didn't concern anybody but myself, that was nobody's business but my own. So I'm going to show you some work from the early 70s. This piece is going to be at Rutgers in an exhibition of um, early women's uh, work from the 1970s and it's called Widow's, Widow's Tongues, and it is from the plant, which is also called a snake plant, which has that long leaf. Um, it was a metaphor for what happened over the years, centuries, over time, to women who were left alone, who were abandoned, who were widows, who were um, by themselves, and the way they were treated. This is a piece from the early 80s. 
Uh, this is an altar piece. This is called Goddess Wall. When I showed some of those early pieces uh, from the 70s um, to my students um, and my assistant, as I was unwrapping them and putting them together to figure out what they looked like after 35 years, it was kind of astonishing. Um, and I thought, well, they don't look so great. You know, I'm so glad I've changed and all of that. And then my students thought, that's cool. And I thought, well, that's so interesting how, how the whole idea of what is good art, what, are it, what is the real essence of art, how we look at art, and what we think about ourselves in relationship to our work. Um, I had to go back and kind of say to myself, put yourself where you were 35 years ago and really try to kind of give yourself the respect and attention that you had when you made this piece and kind of feel that because I think that as the years go by and as we work as artists we often kind of lose sight of that special place of looking just not to deal with the fashion or what happens in terms of um, what we're used to seeing now but just what's really there and that sometimes has a message that is um, often lost. So I did that and I thought, well, maybe it's not as bad as I thought. Um, there's a quote uh, from Elizabeth Murray that I thought I'd read to you, which uh, is very interesting because I think Elizabeth Murray is the fourth woman that has been featured at the Museum of Modern Art over its years. And as you, most of you know, she's having an exhibition now. She's considered, uh, and then this is a t from a Times article, in the art world, an, an artist, artist, they say. Um, in the art world, she's been recognized um, as an artist, artist in general. Part of that is basic sexism. It is much harder for her to get a certain sort of critical attention. And her work didn't go for as much money as the guys, Chuck Close said. He and Miss Murray often remark to each other on how the imagery that turns up in her paintings cups, shoes, and other household objects is often labeled domestic, although that word is not usually applied to Matisse goldfish, to bowls and pattern fabrics, to Cezanne's bowls of fruit, or shoe paintings of Van Gogh or Philip Guston. Around the 19, early 1990s, I started working with gold leaf, and I'm still working with it. Um, there was something about gold leaf that was a lot about sunlight, and I think it's the only way that one can really describe that quality that we live with. So, and these are that was a goddess. Uh, this is a small piece with a spiral. Pieces with found objects and branches of trees. In the 1970s, it was a very exciting time. I was discovering a place of empowerment inside myself. I was so grateful to be alive because I could be involved in feminism. Feminism for me meant exploring everything. Nothing was out of reach. The impact of feminism on many women artists inspired a women's cultural movement. Being part of a consciousness-raising group, I discussed discovered, examined everything from the very essence of my birth to my life as a woman to the forms, colors, and shapes that I put into my art. I asked myself, what was male? What was female? Could the divine be gendered female? What would that be like? Were there unique female images? What did they look like? How were they relevant? Some of us examined women's traditional ways of working, such as quilting, rug braiding, weaving, which until then had been considered lesser forms of art. We considered them as important as paintings and sculptures. The idea that the personal is political was a revelation. I began to incorporate this idea into my life and my art. It was a whole new way of thinking for me. 
Before then, the personal was belittled as something that only women were engaged in and therefore not important. My everyday experience developed a rev relevance that I no longer ignored or dismissed, but included in relationship to my artwork. At this time, as an experiment, I began drawing during these consciousness-raising sessions to try to record visually what was being said. It was an unsuccessful project because the conversations could not be translated visually. However, I found that by doing original primitive so-called drawings, forms belonging only to me would surface. In fact, I noticed that the same forms, those long lines, circles, and angular shapes similar to the kind of images that I had been taught to erase in art school kept returning. Even when I found myself erasing them, I came to treasure them, realizing that they had emotional import as an expression in shapes and colors of the emotional dialogue taking place. A new presence beyond words kept emerging through these forms. When I finally allowed them to come through completely, my work began to flower. Eventually, I accepted my obsession with these lines and shapes as natural and normal. Later, I wondered if the experience of drawing during discussion might be as liberating and stimulating for others as it was for me. In 1979, when I co-founded the Feminist Art Institute, I devised a way to share my experiences in a class called Consciousness Raising Visual Diaries Art Making. As we did consciousness raising that first year in a classroom setting, we chose a topic and each woman drew in a blank book while the others spoke in turn, making a visual record of what was said. The drawings that came out of the workshop confirmed what I had found, that the shapes and forms unique to each of the participants were repeatedly found in her work. This is called the Spirit House of the Mother, and you can enter it. This is the interior with the, sp the spirals and a mother of pearl pink background. This is all carved wood. All the work you'll be seeing is carved wood, except for a few rubbings, which, I'll sh which are self-evident. Uh, this is about 10 feet high, and it's called Great Coat. This is cast aluminum, and it was cast from um, wood carvings, panels, at, for the outdoors. This is called fern with hands. Hickory with ham. This is a series called Passages, which I started in 1998, and which, is conti which continues, and which is about um, different times in my life, different parts. It's like a diary that's done in panels. This is a book I did with a poet, Judith Barrington. Uh, it's called Passages. I use the poet's feet, I use my own feet, uh, my own hands, the poet's hands. And the poems are interspersed in the book. This is the reverse side. One side has the poems on it, the other side is the visual poetry. Poet's Feet. This is the book Closed. It's an accordion book. This is a commission I did for the Robert Wood Johnson Hospital in Hamilton, New Jersey. It's a 28-foot wall. This is a studio shot where the white uh, parts are at the bottom and in the middle piece is, w is where, and you'll see in the um, actual installation, is a, um, a ba barrier, um, nothing like talking public, words just fly away, like Faith's uh, talk. Um, so it's like a banister that's in the middle and a barrier in the bottom so that people don't, um, when they clean, they don't touch the piece. Uh, the piece is made from tracings of the doctor's hands. They chose 12 of the chief doctors and I traced their hands and carved them as flowers. There is a garden on the other side of this uh, sculpture so that it kind of interrelates to the garden that's um, act an actual garden. This is the installation beginning. And that's the piece um, as it's installed today. 
so that you walk down this long, narrow, narrow corridor. On the left is, is a glass window, long panels of glass window, and on the other side is a garden, and uh, this is, reflects the, uh, the garden that's outside. And it's gold leaf, aluminum leaf, um, and caustic, etc. This is a rubbing, and they're done on mylar, and they're from, as you can see, wood panels. Um, this is called White Hand with Gold. This is a, a commission for Phyllis Chesler, the author of Women in Madness, and her partner Susan Bender. And it's called Hands for Phyllis and Susan, and it's tracings of their hands. Uh, this is more recent in terms of the changes pieces. And that's a picture of me back again from the late 70s. Um, looks like I'm carving, and, uh, or just beginning to carve, but moving my hand to work on that log. Thank you very much. working? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Do you know, uh, since we, pro we may have come from very different places when we started working and being in the women's movement. Mm -hmm. um, I, I was a young mother. I was married, a young mother, and um, was really looking. I couldn't understand how um, my life had become so confined. I had never expected it. Mm -hmm. And I remember reading things in the 1970s where they said that women... Um, know what women wrote about their own experiences then was that women in the um, in between the ages of say 18 and 22 often when they're in college didn't really experience the discrimination um, had a sense of freedom that they probably never would have had in their life and I think for me that was that was much more of the case than maybe a lot of other women I don't know how you would uh, interpret it or what did you mean by a sense of freedom? Well, I just, I thought, I, I thought everything was possible then, mm. you know, and I didn't really see, I think I didn't see myself so much as a female or a woman, um, because we used to talk about, in school a lot, about one does and one thinks. Remember, the idea of I, as, um, for self as a woman, um, was not until I began into the women's movement, and I remember trembling at the word I, you know, using mm -hmm. that like that. I don't think I ever thought <clears throat> that freedom was guaranteed. I always thought that freedom wasn't free and it wasn't and isn't. So I understood the, the sense of a struggle from the beginning. I just didn't fully understand that I would have to struggle as a woman. Mm -hmm. I thought that, you know, being black was a big enough struggle. Mm -hmm. And then I found out that it wasn't. But uh, I really did think that it was the struggle until I tried it and found out it didn't work and that I had to understand that being a woman was a desperate struggle and that I had to understand it and get it quickly because you don't have that much time to figure these things out you know, by the time you're 30, you're already middle-aged. Well, especially it's then. True. I mean, I think in the 60s, um, that was very much the case. Yeah, I much think more. it's very much the case today. Well, I think there's a little more leeway today. I mean, really? I, I, I do. You think 30 is not middle-aged today? 
<laughs> I think it is. Well, let's ask the audience. <laughs> no, I don't think 30 is middle-aged. No, I don't. You think it's still young? I think so. I think even 35 and 40 is young. And the older I get, I think that I'll probably think 50 is extremely young in another 10 years. <laughs> Well, I read somewhere, because I used to read all these books about what you needed to do to be an artist, and, and I, I read everything anybody ever wrote. And uh, one of the books I read said that you should, by the time you're 35, you should have reached your mature style as an artist. And um, so I was fighting desperately to get there. To, uh, so I declared my mature style had been reached by the time I was 33. I just declared it. And um, I just didn't want to be, you know, I figured if these white men said that, I better sure as hell say it too. And so I did, and I don't know, I think being an artist is a lifetime thing and that, um, however, it is good to start early and allow yourself to develop through all the stages. And I think after you pass, <clears throat> I think you can still struggle and do crazy things when you're 30, but I think you ought to get prepared for the fact that once you get to be, let's say, 60, people are not going to be that interested in you struggling. So I think you better, you know, get to it. Well, Quit. you know, my friend Lenore, 20, is 98, and she started to make art at the age of 50, and she got recognition, I guess, probably in about 80 or something, although early on a bit in, when she was uh, that. So there, I think for women, perhaps, um, maybe it is a little different. Um, there have been several articles about uh, the situation of women really starting at the age of 50 because there's a kind of freedom that happens mm. when your kids get older and when, I mean, there's other problems, of course, but it's different when, um, when you have no longer that feeling of responsibility that we have when we were younger. Can I jump in for Please. a minute because um, <clears throat> I know Louise Nelson sold her first piece when she was 55. That's encouraging. Uh, but there was a flowering of women artists at the end of the New York school when all the guys had gotten drunk and committed suicide and died mm. off. And there was a flood of, of wonderful old women artists that appeared on the scene. Alice Neal, uh, Nevelson and Louise Bourgeois had been around for a while, but I mean, they really burst. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, Minna Citron, who was my mentor, mm -hmm. uh, Lil Picard. Mm -hmm. uh, Isabel Bishop, oh, you know, just a, f oh, Shari Deans, there were a flood of them. And um, uh, Barnett Newman used to say, painting is an old man's game. And I said, well, he got the gender wrong, but otherwise. <laughs> I always thought that, that maturing was one thing, you know, if you're a ballerina, you were just, you know, oh, that was it. I mean, there was mm -hmm. nothing you could do about that. You would just have to retire. But uh, if you were an artist, I always thought that you'd have I, the women's movement gave me a lot of stimulation in that way. Now today, it's all changed. You have to be 18. Really? When I was 50, you had to be 20. You had to, when I was 25, you had to be 50. When I got to be 50, you had to be 25. Mm -hmm. I just think it takes a long time for anybody to recognize the fact that you're there. And so, therefore, you need to start early and be consistent. Keep going, because you're probably not going to get anywhere until you're old, if you're a woman. This is what I'm saying. Dorothy Gillespie says if, uh, oh, she's still saying, hanging around, she's still there, she's still outside the door. Oh, what the hell, let her in. <laughs> right. That's it. How is Dorothy? She's okay. She's okay. still doing commissions and everything. Yeah, yeah, she really is. Let's see if somebody, some people in the audience do you have questions. Uh, does anybody have any questions now? I always, I always have a bunch of them if nobody else does. Are you feeling shy? Yes. Wait for Doug to bring you the mic so that you'll be on the tape. Oh, I had a question for Faith. 
Um, did you grow up with quilts, or how did you? Did, did were there any quilts in your background that? Um, My great great grandmother, Susie Shannon, um, survived slavery, made quilts as a slave woman, and um, lived to be 110. Died in 1937 in Jacksonville, Florida, and I recall uh, her. Uh, when she died, a trunk came from Jacksonville with all kinds of uh, needlework in it uh, that we used. And that's why I always tell everybody, don't use those things, because what happens is they end up in shreds. So today, I, we don't have anything. Plus, we didn't understand how important quilts were. That was something old ladies did. You know, we absolutely took it for granted. So I have had uh, every, all women in my family sewed, not my daughters, but up to me. We all sewed and we were all taught by our mothers to sew. However, my mother was a fashion designer. And when I got an opportunity to be in a show called The Artist in the Quilt in 1980, um, my mother was my quilt maker, and she, um, she taught me, actually, how to make a quilt. She had made quilts since her grandmother had taught her, when she was a kid. So quilts were natural to my family. I think quilts are natural to most people's family, you know, except that you take them for granted. You know, they're not anything special, except that now we know they are. Being that you ladies were coming in a very difficult time, um, what would you say was the, the one thing that kept you ladies going forward with your art? Uh, you mean, having That's a good growing question. up in the 19, you know, early on in the last century. You mean growing, sorry, you mean growing up in the last part of the century? In the, uh, 60s, or? the 60s. and 50s, yeah. Um, well, it was, um, you're driven. I mean, you just, I think that, um, making art really has some deep impulse inside and that if you're just driven to do it if you're driven to do it in secret that's you know um, how most women worked for a long time or they made work that was more um, acceptable like quilt making uh, in a certain way and um, crocheting um, the tradition I come from is more crocheting so then there's the Italy people did that we made tablecloths and uh, embroidery. And so um, you're just driven to do it, and I think you do it. You find a way to do it, uh, because you have to do it. Well, what kept me in there is that I just always had the attitude, if somebody's going to try to keep me out, that's exactly where I want to go. And uh, i got to find a way to do it, you know, if, if I can't do it through traditional methods, I'll do it, I'll find another way. You know, it's a, it's a spirit of freedom. I guess I was born into struggling to get where it is I want to be. And I know it's possible because I look around and I see other people doing it. So if they can do it, I can do it. Can I butt in for a minute? Uh, uh, one thing about the feminist movement was that in the very beginning there was a real feeling of sisterhood. We had each other. It was very stimulating to say, I can do that. I can do that. Mm -hmm. It became acceptable to work in pastel colors mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or use uh, some intimate feminine in uh, imagery. Small, small things. Yeah, we gave ourselves permission mm -hmm. to be whoever we wanted to be, right. whatever we wanted to be, and we mm -hmm. were determined to be, be mm -hmm. that. You know, that was a real radical thing to be, and it still is. Well, I'm, I'm so impressed by the difference in between your, your art, Nancy, and Faith's. Uh, your art is inward, internal, and, and uh, it's very spiritual, and faith is, is very social and outgoing. And in both cases, though, they are opulent and free. Your colors are just, their colors fly. I also wanted to tell my story. And I didn't really want anyone else to tell it for me, or to manipulate my story, or 
make it into some stereotype of a black woman's story. And then when I found out that I couldn't do that, then that really made me want to do it even more. So that has been what I've been doing, is telling my story, which I think is important for everybody to do. Even if it's just for the family, you know? Even if they're not an artist, it's important to have the family know what your story is, pass it down to them, so that they don't make up something about you later. <laughs> because if you don't tell, it's like my great-great-grandmother Susie Shannon, she wouldn't talk about slavery, she wouldn't give any stories. And I remember growing up, I, I heard my uncles and my mother all talk about how uh, Susie never would talk about it. She said, leave that alone, don't talk about it. So I made up stories about slavery because she didn't say. Now see, if she told me a story, I'd probably told hers, you know? So that's why I think it's really very important to tell your story or somebody will fill, it, fill in the blank lines for you. Well, that was a major contribution of the feminist movement, the, um, the birth of uh, autobiographical visual art. That's another reason why I did it. Because I saw so many feminists telling their mother's stories. And I don't know whether those mothers, you know, approved of those stories or not. <laughs> I didn't want to be one of those mothers with the daughter, because my daughter's a writer. I don't want her telling my story. I want to tell her. Uh, this is a question for Nancy. Uh, you use the hand uh, a, a lot, and I was in Canyon de Chez this past May, mm -hmm. and the petroglyph of the hand with the spiral inside is f that of the uh, healer or the shaman. I was just wondering if you are aware of that, or it's just coincidence that you seem to use that symbol so much. Well, I think it started out by a natural impulse of mine to use the hand and I did work a lot with psychic healing and using meditation and art making in relationship to the energy that you use your hands with. Um, but throughout the world, hands are found uh, in all kinds of art expression. Um, they're outside of um, huts in places, they're on, um, in cave paintings. Um, they're um, just throughout the world in all different parts. So I think it's a natural feeling, some kind of primitive desire to express the self using hands because that's it really the paintbrush is an extension of our hands, the chisel. All of these things are about our arm and our hand and how we manifest what we want mm -hmm. to say with it, like, or like our mouth is for our words. Mm -hmm. We have a lady in the orchestra. Hi, um, Nancy, you have spoken about your work, and I know it's very, uh, it's this combination of this um, spiritual curiosity and, and how it informs your creative process. Um, I was wondering, Faith, um, I know that you I haven't seen enough of your work to know uh, there, there are stories, and, and perhaps there are, uh, you know, folk tales, mythology, biblical stories, and whatnot in, in your work that you didn't show and that I haven't seen, but I was wondering if how you interpret uh, uh, the, your spiritual life or, or if it informs your, your creative process or if your faith informs your creative process or how are those things connected uh, for you as an artist? The only folk tales I tell are the ones I've written. Um, and my work is about my experience, you know, which is real. So even though I'm aware of of a, a great history of uh, folk tales, uh, including African American folk tales, I don't use them in my work. I manipulate them for my own purposes, and I uh, I'm bent on telling my own story based on my own experience. Does that answer you? I was also wondering how, if if there is an element of faith or your or spiritual beliefs, or, or just this notion, like like I said with Nancy, where she actually had an exercise of that caused her to see a creative and spiritual connection coming through in her work, coming through that was sort of buried. I was mm -hmm. wondering if there was something 
in, if you interpret or you see or you sense a, mm -hmm. a spiritual connection or driving force or or something that informs your creative process more than folk tales, but just something deeper, I guess. Well, I I I, I don't I don't know. I don't I don't think so. Although I you know other people may see something like that, but. I think it has to do with real life lived experiences. Although um, Nancy used to have these wonderful um, workshops and I went to several of them in which we would do all kinds of spiritual kinds of works. I mean, I'm capable of, of, of feeling very spiritual. It just doesn't come out in the work, I don't think. Except when I was with Nancy. Um, and I have a whole lot of uh, dolls and other things that I made in Nancy's workshops that I could have photographed and shown, but it, you know, it would be, take up a lot of time here. And, um, and that was wonderful. So I have this, uh, this spiritual life, but I think I'm really more political and spiritual. Totally unique way. Um, I was interested in uh, when you were talking about being on Jones's Road in Englewood. I happen to know some people that live there, really? and I just I wondered. Not my neighbors. <laughs> <laughs> what does that inform? Did you actually depict whatever occurred to you in your work there? I, I didn't because I don't believe in doing anything negative in my work. You know, I mean, no matter what the reference may be, slavery or whatever, I believe in uplifting and upholding and, and going to the, to the side that is, is uh, productive and forward. And so what they did was they did to me very much what the world did to the blues singer. They took all that ugliness and downheartedness and turned it into something beautiful. And that's what I tried to do with Jones Road. You know, I never really understood the Underground Railroad until I met these people. And then, you know, to be surrounded by hostility and not know how hostile is it? You know, or do they just hate me or do they want to kill me? You know, which? <laughs> and, um, and so I, I began to, to paint about it, and uh, it gave me the strength to realize that I am stronger than this. And today I have my studio and my garden and everything else I wanted. And they're still there and I'm still there. And we're all doing what we do. And it's fine. But of course, I'll never forget the experience because it's a singular experience. I never had this experience before. I, I faced racism at, on jobs and schools, you know, different places, but never where I live because I always lived in Harlem around people who maybe didn't know me, but they didn't hate me because I was black. See? So it was a very unique experience for me, and I had to do something with it. And so I just turned it into my blues statement. That answer you? Okay. I don't like to use workshop words like, uh, but I I have to because I think faith. I I remember you from about 25 years ago when you chose one of my pieces for the home show at Goddard Riverside Community Center. But I think your spirituality is in the human connection. I mean, I think there's a great deal of spirit in being human. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know? And I mean, real spirit. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're right. I see. Yes, I do. Hi. I don't really have a question, but the word that uh, you just used, human, 
I think that's maybe the difference between the way the two of you express your art. One is very spiritual, but faith is a humanist in the Renaissance sense of the word. And so looking for something religious or spiritual in the way that, you know, we think of folk spirituality in faith's work may be not the way to approach it, but to approach it as humanist work, work that celebrates living and particularly faith life experience, yeah. Could I interject uh, something right here? This is Lisa Farrington, who has written so many wonderful books, and this one here, which, uh, yes, she did, <laughs> which, is, which is a prize. It's called Creating Their Own Image, The History of African-American Women Artists. And it is the first and only book of its kind. Think about it. First and only. And it is fantastic. And the author is Lisa Farrington. Other questions, or shall I jump in? Was this? Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, wait for the mic, would you? Yeah, because we want you to be on the tape. <laughs> I just wanted to say that for my question from before about, about Faith's spiritual life, actually she kind of answered that question when she answered someone else's question in my mind in that she said, you, you said um, you don't like to paint things that are negative. You like to paint things that build things up that are about growth and progress. To me, that is also very spiritual. To me, talking about things that, that push things forward, that look, that look for the positive things, I, I think that that also is a, I mean, anybody can tear something down, you know. Um, it can take a lot more courage to create something, even in the face of adversity, living in a neighborhood where people, you don't know what people think about you. You, you didn't lash out at them. You, you created work that was beautiful anyway. And I think that that, I think that says something spiritual. I wasn't really thinking necessarily about icons. I was thinking more about um, just, you know, to use a kind of schmaltzy word, a positivity or something like that, mm. you know, so. Okay. okay. I just want to say that the story that Faith read at the beginning is probably the most spiritual story I've heard, and I think it would be marvelous if it was read to every first grader in the United States of America. <laughs> I was really, really impressed. And it's, in, it's reflected in, in the work, in the quilts and the painting, but that story is dynamite. I really appreciate it. Well, that. thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, I did. <laughs> you know, my daughter, who is Michelle Wallace, and who is a, a really great writer, she wrote um, the phenomenal Black Macho and the Myth of the Superwoman back in 1979 when she was only 20. What? Seven, twenty-seven. She was only twenty-seven. She was, you know, a mere kid. And um, well, actually, she was three years from thirty. <laughs> and I, no, I mean, I, I tried to tell her. She kept saying, "Oh, I'm so young." She had this, this, this runaway bestseller, and she thought, "Oh, I'm too young to have this." And I kept telling her, "Look, hey, go forward. Don't even think about it." Uh, you know, she's only three years from from being thirty. But anyway, Michelle used to tell me, don't try to write because you don't have a voice. A writer has to have a voice, she said, when I was writing some of my beginning things that weren't really very good. But um, that made, you, made, you made me by doing that. Because if you say I can't do something, that's it. <laughs> I'm doing it. <laughs> I think that's a really interesting kind of statement for feminism. Yeah. Well, don't you think? I mean, we started out by, yeah. by being brought up and thinking we can't do it. That's right. what we were told. There you go. And right. if you really kind of examine what it was we were doing in the 1969, 1968, 1970, we were saying we can do it, we will do it, and we were going to do it no matter what. And many of us, um, fell by the wayside because that's what life is about. But we really hard. did make a huge change. Um, but in reality, don't you think 
that it's nicer if you if you're brought up at a time when people encourage you no and, question and, and you know what I mean give you these nice strokes it's wonderful I mean I often wish I had been brought up in that time but I wasn't well, I was is... I was earlier than you and when I came along my teachers made a point of letting us know what we could not do they would tell you they told me, stop singing. You can't sing. Well, I was told. That girl, I stop mean, singing. Right, I mean, that's, but that's the way it was. I mean, in, in the 50s and the 40s, and the way people were brought up anyway, you were just, there were all the do's, the don'ts, the can'ts. Do not. Do not. Um, mm -hmm. Women were, had those three little possibilities, right? There you go. Housewife, teacher, nurse. Mm -hmm. Well, the generations that have followed have certainly benefited from this pioneer work. Uh, now, where I don't know where the feminist movement is today, not much of anywhere, and I've been involved in a couple of abortive attempts to get the feminist art artist um, movement started again, and nothing happened. What do you think about that? Is there still, is there still a need? Well, Donna, can still? I ask you a question first? Yeah. What did you expect to happen? I mean, what was it you had in mind when you were beginning to start this up? Oh, what, what um, I mean, no, you I'm said you were trying to start um, a woman's oh, movement. So I was actually, I, I was just an old cynic who was just actually attending these meetings. You know, my generation had burned out on it. Mm -hmm. And I was just hoping that the younger people would, would pick up on it. The same thing happened in, uh, I was a designer for a while, and the same thing happened there, that there was an initial impetus, and then, you know, then it stopped. Well, there are different things that the younger generation has to work with now. I don't think, it's not the same as what we were. I think people never embrace a movement unless it personally affects them. Mm -hmm. It's no matter whether they agree with it or they sympathize with it, they're not going to embrace, embrace it wholeheartedly unless it steps on their own individual toes. Mm -hmm. That's the only way it's going to happen. And obviously it's not doing that today. Well, it's but a different time to too that because conclusion. wouldn't you agree, Faith, that it's a different time because really the idea of I cannot do it for most women is not really the case. I mean, even though it may be the truth that they can't do it because we really haven't seen such a great change in the world. The concept of I can do it is possible now, whereas before, when I was growing up, when you were growing up, it was just not possible. I think, I think they, they have to get older. I think young women um, are, can, can be very cute and, and get by on cuteness. <laughs> but I think as you get older, 30 plus, <laughs> they're no longer looking. I used to say, when I was young, I'd take my work someplace and the guys would look at my legs instead of my art. Then later on, they didn't look at my legs or my art. <laughs> <laughs> so I just think that people figure it out later in life. And we're not far enough away from the 70s for these women to have gotten older and figure it out. Because I think with women, as well as people of color, the art world rotates them. You get a little fame for a while, and then we get somebody else, and somebody else, and somebody else. And it just goes around like that. It's, it's uh, little for each group, you know. Whereas when I came along, nobody got anything. So it was very clear, cut. But I think today that there's a rotation process mm -hmm. that the young people are, are in the, in experience, experiencing. And by the time they get rotated out, they're no longer young anymore. And you know what happens then. You know, nobody wants to hear an old person start crying. So. Well, there's a, there's a, a, a plethora of bad girls in art now. Uh, there were a few during our day, uh, uh, Carol Lee Schneeman and, and later on uh, K 
Karen Finley, and now there's just a whole lot of them, like Tracy Emin in, in England, who exhibits her semen-stained sheets and, and uh, all the facts of her abortions and um, uh, the, the uh, young woman who... Um, her, a commission piece by a collector was that he took her to a hotel room and they just robed and had sex and then the video then he paid her and that was the commission and um, oh, I'm not sure how much art is involved in this but and but there's just you know there's there's just endless people they the uh, the artist who does the models you know the, the naked models and standing in the Guggenheim with perfect bodies and you know if you're gonna operate this way you really only have until you're 30 right before, I keep telling you before gravity sets in Absolutely. now was it but but well, this is an be effect Alice of Neal. the women's movement I remember going to the bank down the block from where I lived on Great Jones Street which is third Street and going into the bank and giving my money to the teller and looking up and there was a huge portrait of a naked Alice Neal, probably around the age of 75, right. uh, with her paintbrush in hand doing a self-portrait of herself in the self-portrait. Oh. And I remember my jaw dropping because, first of all, it was, I don't know, Chemical Bank? And there it was, <laughs> right above me. And so, uh, yes, there's those, but there is this, too. Yeah. There never was a bad girl like Alice. She was the original. Oh, she was great. You yeah. see, and, and yet she um, continued until she was well, what, into her late 80s, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. and she passed on. And she was a bad girl. I mean, in terms of her personality, you'd be in a group with her, and she'd always have something sort of off to say, mm -hmm. to make everybody stop and look at her. You know, I mean, she, there was that quality. But Carolee Schneeman was, I think, the first. Karen Finley came to much later. Mm -hmm. Carolee Schneeman, I think, really did the um, body imagery yeah. well before any other women were doing it, actually. Well, the, the, the contrast I like to make with, with uh, Carolee Schneeman and, and uh, Tracy Emin is that uh, Carolee Schneeman pulled poetry out of her vagina and read it to the audience, and Tracy Emin pulls money out. And it's just, you know, it really is... <laughs> It's very fitting it's for this time, it is, isn't it? Well, I was wondering, why don't we have a revolution of gray-haired artists? Why don't we bring gray-haired artists to the full, uh, to the full, why don't we have a Whitney Biennial full of gray hairs? I mean, why don't we do a revolution this way? Why are we looking to the youth to do it? We're still working. We can do it. Well, they how are doing the gray-haired uh, guys? Guys. Guys. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They're having that, but they're guys. <laughs> How do they look with their clothes off? With their oh, boy. <laughs> well, you know, the men don't take their clothes off. They, even when they're young, they don't do that. They put more clothes on. You know, the, the young women are taking their clothes off, and the young men are putting on more clothes. It's well, very all, interesting. All right? of that may be true, but we are doing it, as Barbara pointed out. I mean, we are literally making our work. We are growing with our work. We are sitting here today talking mm -hmm. about it. Yeah. We have books out. I mean, this is something that simply could not have been done 40 years ago, 35 years ago. And I think that that is a major change. Oh, yeah, okay. I agree. I well, agree I, that I, there's a I, major change. I had a question. Um, I was wondering, both of you have traveled quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And I was just wondering um, what effect that had on your work or going to other countries, seeing what other cultures or what other women's lives are like there. What, mm -hmm. what, how did that, uh, uh, um, how did that work, work itself into your, your work? Mm -hmm. Well, I, th I think uh, that it's absolutely necessary for, for an artist to travel. I think you should know the art of the world, your own and everyone else's, because all the art belongs to everybody. And you can use it, uh, you know, as freely as you like, as long as you know where it came from. Um, so I think it's really important to travel the world and see everybody and experience what everybody else is doing. It enriches your culture and makes you feel good about it. You should first go back to your ancestral home. Uh, I went to Africa. I've been to all parts of it except South Africa. 
and uh, it really made me sure that I could be an artist because I saw the great art of Africa and I, I knew that belonged to me. So I think it's really important to go. And I lived in Italy. Um, I went back to my ancestral place in Italy, um, although I lived in the north of Italy rather than the south of Italy, which is where my family comes from, and um, was able to make a cultural reference uh, between the, how I grew up and how they are, how they were. And it was a major learning experience as a woman because um, at that time, in 1968, men wouldn't become your, enter your home if your husband wasn't there, for instance. I mean, it was very um, difficult. The women would come to me and say, how do you make art? How do you do it when you're married? And so I couldn't wait to get home uh, because it just felt so bound up. And there were women artists who were, you know, a few women artists who were making art who were doing things like themselves wrapped up you know, um, very kind of confined the experience of how they felt about themselves. And then I went back to Italy. I've been back many times since then, but recently, um, I didn't go back until maybe 19, late, late 80s. And then recently, the last time I stayed there for a while, the whole thing had changed. Mm. Women were now out expressing themselves and really taking an active role in their life. The women's movement had moved to Italy. And so... Oh. Um, that part's quite exciting when you travel around and you see what women are accomplishing all over the world. And, of course, traveling to a non-Western place, you know, non-European, is like standing on your head, at least I thought, because I had to deal with concepts and ideas that were so foreign to the way I grew up, and I really kind of embraced them in ways um, that were very exciting and very um, disorienting and very um, interesting. I mean, all of those different parts. And that began to get into my work in a whole new way. Um, and if you don't travel, you don't see that. I mean, right. I think that's what the problem, say, with our president. One of the main problems is he never traveled anywhere. <laughs> you know, I mean, I don't think he even went to Europe, if I remember, before he became president. So um, unless you really see how other people live and how other people solve the problems of your life, you know, a life that's similar to yours, how they solve those problems in their own way, yeah. your mind is very, very narrow. Mm -hmm. um, is there a, a woman's art today? Is there art that can be characterized as fem a feminist art? Or it seems to me that the guys are all doing the same stuff that the women are doing, like installations with sequins and feathers, uh, and, and a lot of autobiographical They've been inspired. Stuff by us. It's all that flying, right? <laughs> Quietly. <laughs> where is art, where, where do, what is your fix on where art is going? Where I, you know, maybe the audience should say, I know where my art is going, and you know where yours is going, I do, but, but you, you know, know. Well, yeah, I agree, but um, did it, if people have read, say, the Times uh, review, uh, I think it was Michael Kimmerman's review of John Snyder's work mm -hmm. recently, Oh, where they um, and other other reviewers too, they talk about the feminist content in her work, and they talk about the messiness of it. You know, mm. the messy kind of discussions of her life, uh, her um, uh, loss of a child, and all the stillbirth, and all that kind of. Or I think it was miscarriage, but that kind of thing. And they talk about how she stuck with that feminism. It's the first time I've seen that in a very long time. First time I've seen it not kind of dismissed or put down. So something's happening. You, know, you mentioned or, Elizabeth Murray And Elizabeth earlier. Murray yeah, earlier. With her yeah. domestic subject matter. Right, and that's Elizabeth Murray, I think I said, was the fourth woman featured at the Museum of Modern Art in its history. Now, I was trying to remember if there was a fifth, but if there's a fifth, that's, a, that's it. I mean, mm -hmm. there's a very limited amount of women who have been featured there. And so hopefully these things now will have some kind of a, a, new, op a new possibility, a new mm -hmm. opening, so mm -hmm. that women will get the kind of attention, uh, even mm -hmm. this panel, you know, I think is, uh, is a good start. And then there's the Sackler, um, the, the Brooklyn Museum, the hmm. opening of the Brooklyn Museum and the uh, Judy Chicago um, exhibition there. So it's, it's um, a whole lot of things that, that bode well 
Um, but as Faith pointed out, it may be circular. But it's our responsibility as women, all of us, and as Barbara was pointing out, we should, maybe we should get together and have a gray-haired show. It means I, I can't go and get my little blonde streaks anymore. <laughs> but, um, but it's our responsibility to make sure it doesn't die. Because the history of the, woman, of the women's movement in, in, um, started with Mary Wollstonecraft, and, or, but you can even read about many, many women who struggled, and then you lose the history. I remember, I don't know if Faith remembers, but in the 1960s and 70s when the red stockings and the women who were just starting were discovering all these writings that women had, had, um, had published or had written, the diaries, mm -hmm. all of this is because women went out there and went through old uh, shops, antique stores, and really pursued finding this information, and it got published. Things that I never even knew existed. Women artists, they're still discovering that we never knew existed. So, I mean, there are things happening. Maybe the audience could tell us, some of the young people in the audience could inform us of what's happening. No? Yes. No. Yes, no. I don't it might not be like hip, you know, to complain. What? You know, it might not be—it might not be a hip thing, you know, to 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 act like you have that you're any different from the guys. You know, maybe it's not hip. Is it hip? Do you think? Is it hip or not hip? I see that there's because you are different. We know this. We know you're different, but I mean, is it not hip to admit it? Could we have a show of hands? Hip. Not hip. Yeah, hip hop. <laughs> and we know they're under 30. <laughs> we know that. The, the women are, not the men. The men can be 85. This is true. Um, <laughs> this is true. <laughs> I want to say that it's the life. I remember, I think it's been 15 years or more since you were with us. Yes. But it's nice to have had you back. Mm -hmm. And Nancy, I thank used you to teach also. Here. No, years I mean ago. at Artist Talk on Art. Right. Oh, yeah. we used to, yeah, it was great. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, thank you both and Donna for helping. And thank you all for coming. And come down thank you. and look at the books. Take a look at the books. Thank you so much. You all. Well, I, I hope everyone enjoyed uh, that recording, that dialogue as much as I did. It was. Yes, very nice. much. And it took it us was, back in time it, to. It was uh, wonderful. The, of the feminist movement and how we all were involved. And it yeah. was wonderful. It was uh, very interesting. I was a member of uh, Women in the Arts way back then. Yes. And, uh, they were very activist artists. And uh, we incorporated a lot of these uh, very well-known artists of today. We're all part of our group. And it was just, uh, th this brought me back to that way back when. <laughs> well, thanks everyone for joining us. And uh a big thanks to Maruna, our Zoom team, and programming assistant Susanna, and our board, and many numerous volunteers and interns that make this kind of historical preservation of uh, these talks possible. Have Thank a nice you. evening. Thank you. Thank Good you. Night.